we went through the area of, era of low fat. Then recently we've gone through this era of keto and low carb. And there's only one macronutrient left. There's carbs, there's fat, and there's protein. <laughs> and we're so going we to argue about all of them, aren't we, <laughs> as a community? And so protein <laughs> is the latest darling of the nutrition world. And now everywhere you go, you're like protein this, protein that, protein bars, protein shakes, protein sticks, protein, you know, and it's like, wow, okay, somehow everybody's sticking protein in everything. Uh, is that good? Is that bad? And what do we know about protein? And 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 uh, what should we be thinking about it? Because I think, you know, there's a whole conversation going on that we should be eating two or even three times sometimes what is the RDA recommendation for protein. Uh, and there's controversy about whether plant protein is as good as animal protein and what that does to muscle as we age. And this is an area of expertise for you. So now we covered the uh, CETO thing. I want yeah. to kind of get into the protein <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah. and then dive right in. I'm not scared yeah, yeah. of d- d- difficult subjects, which is why I like talking to you. Yeah. And and these uh, things are interconnected in yeah. some ways, which is what I realized. So I, I began my career as a physiotherapist and I was splitting my time up between working. I was very lucky to get a job working with professional athletes in, in Melbourne in Australia, mm-hmm. but it was on the provision that I would also work out in a community center, which is a completely different demographic less affluent, not on private health insurance, a lot of chronic disease, a lot of chronic back pain. And I, it didn't take long for me to notice that a lot of folks with chronic back pain who were also overweight were coming in with fatty liver disease, diabetes, they were under-muscled. And these yeah. things are very, very related. Maybe over fat or under lean right. or both. <laughs> both. And, and what we're seeing is increasingly we're seeing both. We're seeing over-nutrition and we see increased body fatness coupled with sarcopenia, loss of muscle size and function and quality. I would say excess calories, not over nutrition, because you know, right? If you get nu- nutrition, I think of it as, as food, and and I often said this, but if if you actually look up the definition of food, it, it, in various you know places, it's it's somewhat worded differently, but the essence of it is food is something that supports the health and growth and development of an organism, and, and by definition, ultra processed food technically isn't actually right. even food so excess so, calories and still yeah. still malnourished just yeah. in another way yeah and i'm very vitamin deficient right so i was i was observing that these things are are interconnected and and what we see is from the age of about 30 onwards we see a reduction in muscle mass about half to to kind of um one percent per year and then by the age of 50 that can ramp up so you you can be losing one to two percent of your muscle mass per year Right, mm-hmm. so you could be losing 10 14 percent of your muscle mass mm-hmm. per decade mm-hmm. after the age of, of 50. From age 50, you're losing more strength per year than you are muscle mass, which is also really important strength and power. And we can maybe come back to that. Yeah, because um, I don't think people understand the difference between muscle mass, yes, and strength and power. And there is an association, but you're mm-hmm. actually losing uh, more strength relative to the amount of muscle that you're losing as you age. And and power, which becomes really really important when we look at risk of falls. Let's come let's come back to that. Primarily, if we're trying to maintain and build muscle mass throughout our uh, adult life, and maintain the quality and function of that muscle mass, it comes down to the movement that we're doing or not doing, and our nutrition, which is where protein becomes really important among among um, other things, right? And from a a if we were to look at sustainability, this is like our society right now. Like well, what is driving a lot of the sarcopenia? I think protein is important to a degree. The average protein intake is at about 1.2 grams per kilogram at the moment in, in America, um, which could be a little bit further optimized. But what's really the problem is the sedentary lifestyle and the lack of the, the stimulus. Yeah. Right? Um, if you don't use it, you, you lose it. And unfortunately, what happens is that the, when you're not stimulating the muscle, the kind of motor units, the nerves that go into the muscle that innovate them, that allow us to contract and control, they, they die off. And so something that I think is often not appreciated is that as we're aging, we're not just losing muscle mass, but the quality. We're losing quality muscle. And we get a shift from type two kind of fast switch fibers and the fast twitch, fast twitch means fast to fatigue, but we can, we can produce power really quickly, produce force really quickly. 100 yard dash. Right. And react really quickly. Whereas the slow twitch are more 
slower to fatigue, more endurance kind of muscle fibers. And as we age, we get this reduction in the fast twitch and relative increase in slow twitch. And that is what leads to us having less power and being more at risk of falls. Because when when you when you fall and you have to catch yourself, mm-hmm. you have to produce force really quickly yeah. through the knee, through the hip. Yeah. And this is this is critical. And it as comes back to just falling over like a building and the tree in the forest. Right. Boom. You know, like yeah. That's what so kills people. In order for us to combat this, and we see this, Mark, if you look at masters athletes, there's some studies. I mean that, older athletes. Older older athletes, right? So athletes that are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, sometimes early 80s that have been physically active throughout their life, they can attenuate a lot of that muscle loss. So this is not just a normal part of aging, yeah. right? It is, it is from living a sedentary lifestyle and not having that stimulus there. You know, I was, I don't know if you know this, I was sick this year and I had back surgery and long story short, I had a, a, an infection in my back. I was in bed for six weeks. I lost 20 pounds of muscle because I didn't have much fat on me to start with. That was about 10, 12% body fat. And I was scared because I was 65 and I didn't know if I could actually gain the weight back. But being very disciplined about my protein intake, the quality of the protein and being in the gym every day with a physical therapist and trainer, I gained back 25 pounds of muscle. And I was like, wow, at 65, like I'm sort of shocked because I was like, I'm just going to be a frail old man after this thing. And I was like, if you actually give the right inputs yeah. to the body, even when you're older. It wants to adapt. So what we understand yeah. is that the age-related muscle loss that we've kind of normalized in society because it's so pervasive and we mm. see it, it's actually not normal. Yeah. And we can, we can intervene and we have a lot more say. And the yeah. earlier we intervene, the better, but it's also never too late, like you just said. But and- you know what's so crazy, Simon, is that I'm a doctor and I never learned how to evaluate sarcopenia. Then I went to work at Canyon Ranch in 1996 and they had a DEXA machine. And it was the first time I'd seen actually a body composition scan or knew really what it was about or learned about it or understood the difference between visceral fat or belly fat and your butt fat or your android or gynecoid fat levels. And I was like seeing these things and I was just sort of like, wow. This is like a black hole in medicine. And there's some interesting now uh, biological tests like blood work that you can get that helps indicate sarcopenia oh, wow. that are derivative calculations from other biomarkers. And so those are things we're going to be adding to function. And we just added uh, Ezra, which is a scanning company. And you can do an MRI body composition, which is extremely accurate. And uh, and you can find out what's going on. But you, you've got to measure your muscle yeah. mass and your body fat. Because if you don't have a good sense of what that is, mm. you're kind of flying blind. And I think it's really motivating too, to measure and then to intervene and see these science-based interventions really work, to see the improvement and know that you are moving in the right direction. Or if they're not working, to know that you you get to iterate and and change uh, what you're doing. But the two most important things there to combat this loss of muscle function and quality is a the the training we're doing. So mm-hmm. having resistance training in place. And also ideally having some type of power training like plyometric, like box jumps or um, squat jumps mm. or skater kind of um, side lateral side bounds, yeah. that that type of movement. Uh, what else can we throw in there? We can throw in kind of um, broad jumps, burpees if you can mm. do them. And even if you can run like earlier in life, sprinting is a, yeah. is a great power um, movement which will help you maintain, preserve, look after all of those fast switch motor units which is really important. And then when it comes to, to, to our diet, protein is super important. And as you said, this has been heavily debated. So how much do we need? What source is best? Yeah. And then I'd say kind of below those two is like, does the timing matter? Yeah. And over the last 10 years, we've had an abundance of research that's helped us, I think, piece this together with much more confidence. Although- you know, in science, we always have to have a degree of humility and understand we don't know everything yet. Yeah, yeah. So there still are some things to learn. But overall, uh, when it comes to, and I've changed my view on this over the years, but when it comes to the outcomes of muscle mass and strength, it looks like you want to be consuming at least 1.2 to 1.6 grams of protein per kilogram. And, when, and currently the, the, the RDA, which is... Point eight, is, point 0.8 is low. And, and can you explain how they come up with that? What is point 0.8? Yeah. 
They do these the nitrogen problem. balance studies and they were done a long, long time ago. But I'd say just at a very high level to explain that those studies are more looking at a requirement of protein. Like preventing protein deficiency. Not an optimization of protein. Yeah, right. And these are two different things. So how much you need to be a healthy 75-year-old versus how much you need so you don't get protein malnutrition, right? right? So, Which is not... <laughs> yeah, so I, so I, I don't mentioned wanna... before that after the age of 50, you could be losing 1% or 2% of your muscle mass per year. Yeah. Those studies done back in the day, they were not looking at how do you attenuate that? How do you slow that down? Yeah. So I just want to make that abundantly clear. The research suggests that you need a little bit more protein than, than the RDA at yeah. 0.8 if you want to do that. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting it's how much protein is out there. Because yesterday I went to work out at Equinox and I did a pretty hard workout. And then I went down and they had a little smoothie bar and they had a whey protein smoothie with all this healthy stuff. And it was like 54 grams of protein. And I was like, wow. And then when I do my calculation based on the 0.8, it's I need 67 for the whole day. So the question is, how much should I be really getting at a 65-year-old guy to, to not just not lose muscle, but actually to build muscle? And you're saying it's more like 1.2 to 1.6 or Yeah, something. when you look at, there's a, a beautiful study that looked at strength um, in, and protein intake at two different contexts. So one was looking at as you dial up protein in the context of someone who's doing resistance training. And then the other is if you dial up protein and they're sedentary. Yeah. What happens to strength? What you see is increasing protein without resistance training. Doesn't do anything. Basically does nothing. Yeah, it's like it's like putting the ingredients for soup in a pot but not turning <laughs> on the heat. Right. right. So and and if you like 80, 80 or ninety percent, I think, of the US population are not meeting the resistance training guidelines. So that's like the number one I think that's thing. Generous. <laughs> yeah, that could be generous, but that's like the number one thing to address. Yeah, yeah. Let's make that clear. Yeah. And, and you mean resistance, meaning strength training. Yes. And, you know, and ideally, weight, I think weights, it's in, yeah. the, in the, you know, there's a lot of debate around what's the best rep range. Personally, I think that that eight to 12 rep range is a good rep range because it's not, the load's not too heavy where you increase risk of, of injury for mm -hmm. people where the load's super heavy mm -hmm. um, in that kind of four rep range where you need to be a much more experienced lifter to avoid injury. Um, also at the eight to 12, you get the added benefit of loading the, the skeleton. So you get the bone mineral density benefits that you, you don't get as much if you're doing a lightweight and doing 30 reps. Yeah. So I do like the 8 to 12 as a general kind of heuristic, particularly for healthy aging. But I mean, 8 to 12 to fatigue, where like the, yeah. the, the 12th one, it's like you can't do one more. Yeah, and, the, and that's a great point. So it's you should be within a, 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 an effective if eight, set. Eight, if you're doing 12 reps of a five-pound weight, that's no. not... Sorry. Yeah, so, so <laughs> an effective set of 8 to 12 would be that those last two reps are within failure. You're, you're, you're getting two, a couple reps within failure, mm -hmm. right? So if you were to continue the set, you would only be able to maybe lift it one or two more times and you'd be losing form. Yeah, right. Is a good right. way of kind of looking yeah, at that. Yeah. And in terms of an intensity, you might describe that as like an eight out of 10 mm -hmm. in terms of intensity of 10 is all out, Yeah, right? Um, but in this study, the if you look at the context of resistance training, and and strength as you dial up protein mm -hmm. most of the benefit is is driven once you get to 1.2 there is a little bit further getting going from 1.2 to 1.6 grams it's kind of like squeezing the last few drops out of the towel mm -hmm. right so in terms of our priorities number one is have regular resistance training in place ideally each muscle group in your body the main muscle groups you're getting at least 10 effective sets in a week in the way that we just described is a, is a minimum kind of stimulus to promote strength. and so What is it, like three times a week? Workout? Yeah, you could split that easily across three workouts. And when I say muscle groups, a simple way would be thinking of, of movement patterns. So uh, 10, 10 kind of pushing, mm -hmm. which could be overhead or horizontal pushing, 10 sets of pulling mm. in yeah. the two different planes, yeah. and then obviously lower body, you're going to have, you know, 10, 10 sets of like some type of squatting pattern, 10 sets of some type of hinging pattern, yeah. like a deadlift, but over a week. And if you split that across three workouts with a personal trainer, yeah. you can split that up. And that's, a, that's, a, that's enough volume to promote uh, muscle hypertrophy growth yeah. and also strength. And then depending on how much time you want to invest in this, you can build that up to 20 sets per muscle yeah, group yeah. if you have enough time yeah. and you'll get some extra benefits. Well, I find it interesting that I asked you about protein and we end up talking about strength training. Well, <laughs> I think that's really important. And, and, I, <laughs> and it's, it's intentional <laughs> yeah. because we spend so much time talking want, about protein. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, the studies show that existing protein intake 
is already at a level where people would be building and maintaining a lot of muscle uh, if they just added the stimulus. Yeah. 